Okay, so we are going to plan for changes to your org. So it's about planning. Let's plan things carefully and mindfully. So let's talk about this. First of all, I want to emphasize that we need to write down our release plans write them down either on a piece of document on your computer or a piece of paper better on a piece of document and self um, maybe as a uh, self knowledge base uh, for your own on your own salesforce org make a new object um, for or notes to plan releases for your own notes or your team's notes so Prepare the release environments. We have several steps here. Um, first step, we want to develop. Second, we want to test. Third, we want to build the release. And then we want to test the release. And then we release them. So, depending on the phase where where we are and what we are doing, we are using a particular type of sandboxes. So for developing, we want to use the developer sandbox. This is a sandbox. You cannot access a sandbox through trailhead, unfortunately. So I'm just going to show you how a sandbox looks like uh, in a minute, but, but it will be on a real Salesforce org not a trailhead so you can see how creating a sandbox looks like okay and so this is the type of sandbox we are using the developer sandbox for development and then testing so if you have say three developers i would assign each developer their own developer sandbox so this is for john this is for jane this is for rick and they each have their own sandboxes to develop and then they deploy it for for the build release onto the developer pro sandbox okay here each development um, component so to speak is all deployed on this org and then we test it here so like for example, each team member migrates their customizations from their respective, respective developer sandboxes to a shared developer pro sandbox for integration. Developer pro sandboxes do not contain, do not contain production data, but you can seed them with testing data, right? So if you play it around in developer pro sandbox and everything looks good, you go to the KC, uh, the full sandbox. I was mentioning my own organization. Um, the full sandbox um, and create a, com a complete replica of the production. Okay. The full sandbox, when, once everything looks good on the full sandbox, you then release it to your production org. So, how can you create these sandboxes for this cycle? First, develop and then test and then your your build release and your test release and then you actually release it to your production so unfortunately as i said we can't simulate this on trailhead it would be awesome is if salesforce can produce some kind of simulation so people who are still learning can actually try this out you know um, learn how to manage change sets and 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 so on so i'm just going to launch um my organization's org and i'll show you how it looks like so as you can see um, i am now on a real salesforce production org this is not a trailhead org so you will not have this option i just want to show you on how you can create sandboxes 
So basically you are on a setup page and then you just um, search for sandboxes there and you click there and you can see um, your sandboxes that's currently alive. For this example, I have this um, one full sandbox, type is the full sandbox. So what are full sandbox for? So the full sandbox is for actually release, uh, test release, right? Before the launch or deployment to production. So if I go back here, I can create a new sandbox by clicking here, new sandbox. So on your production org, you can see how many sandboxes you can deploy. I still have 45 developer sandbox available, 45, which is a lot one developer pro, one partial copy, and zero full sandbox because I have one full sandbox here. So this is how you actually deploy or create a new sandbox. You hit new sandbox there, and then you choose um, you choose what uh, the sandbox name will be. I'm just gonna name it um, development testing or just dev maybe dev test okay and you can choose create from which existing org you can create from another sandbox which is you can choose here or you can create from your production so when we do this it will copy the metadata all the objects all the reports dashboards of this org or the, the org you choose to the sandbox you are creating. No data is actually copied, no records, just the metadata such as the objects, or the flows, or the custom fields, validation rules, apex, classes, triggers, everything, but the records itself, all right? So let's say I want to copy uh, from the production metadata on a developer sandbox and assign it to John Doe. Okay, I'm gonna hit next here. I have 45, oh, I can't use spaces there. So dev test, no spaces. I'm gonna hit next. And if you wanna run a particular Apex class, once the developer sandbox has been deployed, you can choose so, like whatever process you want to run but I'm going to leave this blank and simply hit the create button. So this will take a long time. You can see the developer is pending status is in queue. And even if I refresh this page here, it's still pending and then you can see it's processing. And then you can see the progress of um, how this sandbox is being deployed when it's ready, you can have this login button and you can launch and log yourself into the sandbox and start developing. So that's how you provision sandboxes, okay? So you can also do a sandbox templates and you can, you can see the history of your sandboxes there, all right? So let's go back to the trailhead. So I've just uh, shown you how you can create sandboxes and then next we are talking about establish your change tracking method, all right? So when you are doing um, change set management, sometimes the metadata, uh, the API version on your production, on your real org is different than your developer sandboxes. So sometimes you can't deploy it there. If that's the case, you have to track your changes and you have you have this metadata uh, coverage web page that you can use what's available, what's not available. You have the version here and you can see all the metadata type on the left and you know what chain set supports. This is supported by chain set this is supported by chain set. This is supported by chain set. Some things are not supported by chain set. So what if it's not supported by chain set? What should you do? Good question, right? 
Well, you have to do manual migration. What is a manual migration? Basically, a manual migration is creating it manually on your production org, right? So instead of doing, um, I'm gonna go back here, or yeah, instead of actually uh, doing a change set, which is you can do from here, change set, um, outbound change sets, and you can see um, how this change set can be deployed. So I'm, I can create new and, and show you how it works later on the other um, trail after this. But not everything you can deploy or migrate using change set because certain things are not supported by change set. See, it's blank, there is no checkbox. So if things are not supported by the change set, you have to create them exactly on the production org. You will have to do it by hand, okay? So some um, some are not supported, so you have to do it by hand by creating them on your production org. That's how you do manual migration. And then you have to track everything, you know, use your own uh, tracking method. Just make sure every changes um, is, is, is tracked and logged properly. You can also use the um, set up audit trail here to monitor your changes. Okay, so that's the intro or the plan to for changes to your org. Okay, let's do the quiz and then we can do the next one. And maybe I can show you how you can actually do a um, change set deployment, just a simple one, because you cannot um, simulate this on a Trailhead Playground um, org. You can't. Why is it important to track changes made during development? Why? To identify what should go in a change set, to generate a metadata coverage report, to eliminate the need of manual deployments, to know which components are supported in a metadata API. I think it's D. Yeah. Why is it important? Let's, let's choose D. Um, to know which components are supported in metadata API. So you know which one that, that is not supported, then you can do manual migrations on ones that are not supported. Does that make sense? You have to recreate them manually on the production org. What makes a developer sandbox a good choice for development over other types of sandbox? So this is the basic one, developer sandbox is the basic one, the really, really basic one. Remember, if I go back to my sandboxes here, now it's still processing, see? So developer sandbox is the, the entry, which you have um, 200 megabytes, and this is one gigabyte of pro, and then you have partial copy and a full copy. So why would you use the entry one, the developer sandbox? It provides access to production, customer data. No, we don't have customer data, no records on sandbox, a developer sandbox. It is a good user acceptance testing. Now this would be the full sandbox. It allows developers to keep release change. It allows developers to keep release changes isolated. That's right. It contains developer tools. No, every, every org has the same developer tools. So let's do that and I'll see you on the next section. Oop, we got one wrong. I think this is A, to identify what should go in a change set. <laughs> that got it subscribe right. bada button bada boom. and explore new trailhead grounds and learn to implement the most useful and popular apps on the Salesforce app exchange. And do yourself a favor. Like this video and you'll be surprised on how much more you understand when watching this same video after liking it. Don't take my word. Watch this one more time after you like the video and see it for yourself. Bada bing, bada boom.